And Tuesdays, we go live to the nation's capital and Pulitzer Prize winning reporter David Farenthold at the Washington Post. So impeachment trial number two is underway. So so off the top, do you see any chance at all of conviction? here? I do think there is a chance. I don't think it is an overwhelming chance, but I think it's better than the basically zero chance that there was at, for the first impeachment at the start of 2020. And is there a sense among members of Congress that whether there's a conviction or not, that, that a message needs to be sent that this is just not acceptable behavior? I think there is a sense among many of them that, that, that what Trump did was unacceptable. Whether that translates into a vote for a conviction or a vote to bar Trump from office, I don't know. A lot of Republicans have said, you know, that they think that, the, you know, the, the getting Trump out of office means that there really isn't a role for them anymore. They, even though there, there seems to be precedent for impeaching a former president uh, or a former official, they seem to believe like they shouldn't do it. Yeah. Actually, what is your role now? Because, I mean, you made your name tracking Trump's finances. So are you are you off the Trump beat at this point? No, uh, there's actually a lot of interest in, in what Trump is doing now. His business is under a lot of strain. And I think people are interested in sort of seeing how that sorts out. I don't think this will be something I'm doing in a year. Uh, but at least for the next few weeks or months, the the story of what becomes of the Trump organization, I think, is a pretty mm-hmm. fascinating one. Let's wrap up some of the loose ends. I know one of the first things that you were trying to figure out was whether Trump was in violation of the emoluments clause because his hotels were obviously accepting payments from uh, overseas individuals. What's happened to that? Basically nothing. Um, <laughs> so there there were a lot of legal cases filed, and then there was a lot of wrangling over just the question of who had the right to right to sue, who is standing to sue, could I? Maryland and the District of Columbia sue? Could competitors sue? Could a good government group sue? And we never got even the answer to that pretty basic question. So the, the case lingered before the Supreme Court long enough that yesterday they declared it to be moot because Trump is no longer president. So we really don't have any idea of what an quote unquote emolument is and what presidents should be barred from doing or not doing. So we'll have to wait for the next president who operates a business that does business with foreign governments <laughs> to find that out. So Joe Biden, as far as I know, is not doing that. No, no. His, he seems to be in a whole different level of wealth from uh, from Trump. Um, on the um, the uh, what was the other thing? I was gonna oh. Fact checking. CNN ran its first fact check on uh, on Joe Biden, and uh, I was reading through it, and uh, basically they could not find very much wrong with anything he <laughs> said about things like the number of educators who have lost. I mean, basically it was a pretty uh, boring topic, but uh, he was talking <laughs> about educators who've lost their jobs and how we have to help them. Um, the Republican Party saying it was a, a false flag attack, things like that. Um, what what is the future of fact checking if you have a president who actually looks up stuff? <laughs> well, I think he will go back to the way it was under, under Obama. There will be fact checks of the president when he gets something wrong, the fact checks of others in politics. But it won't be sort of an all consuming, you know, dozens of lies per day uh, business the way that it was under Trump. We've never had a president as, as thoroughly dishonest as Trump. So I don't think you'll see. You know, anybody breathlessly trying to keep up with with Joe Biden during a rally, you know, with, you know, with a different lie in every sentence. But the business of holding people to account and figuring out whether they're lying to us still goes on. It just may not be quite as busy. So are you going to have to lay off fact checkers? <laughs> no, no. We, we'll find not. other uses for them. If there's too many on the team, well, they'll find other jobs. OK. Um, Joe Biden got to work right out of the gate. I, I lost count of all the uh, executive orders. Uh, but there's also this concern that if he can't get cooperation from, from Congress, he will have to govern by executive orders. And the, and the problem with that is, as as the Trump people know, is that the next president can just reverse them all, which is what uh, which is what Biden is doing to uh, to Trump now. So I'm having a trouble getting a handle on whether Mitch McConnell is now a reformed person and believes in cooperation or whether this is just going to be another four years of tit for tat. I think, well, it's a little early to tell, but I do think that the Democrats who have a majority in the House and the Senate will succeed in getting some of their stuff through. They will make policy changes. I think the first thing probably will be the um, some sort of additional COVID stimulus package. Uh, it's going to be hard, but the fact that the Democrats have a, the majority and have the experience of working with McConnell under Obama, when basically McConnell used Obama's promises to unify the country against Obama by blocking him at every turn and stymieing many of the things that he that he promised. I mean, think about health care. How long did health care last because they wanted to get one Republican vote? 
I don't think that Biden, who had a front row seat to that, is going to make the same mistakes that Obama did. So I think they will get more out of the Senate, even with McConnell in the way. Is there a concern over the price of this package? And will the Republicans rediscover their uh, concern about deficits? I'm sure they will. I mean, after the, the Trump years in which the deficit skyrocketed, I think you're already seeing some Republicans discover their uh, aversion to or rediscover their aversion to spending. But I do think that the Democrats, who have 50 seats in the Senate, will find a way around that. I think the most important vote in the next two years is probably going to be Joe Manchin of West Virginia, the most conservative Democrat. What he wants probably will, you know, because he's the 50th vote, uh, which let, lets them let Kamala Harris break ties. I think whatever Manchin wants is going to be the most important factor, not what the Republicans want. Yeah. Now, do you find it at all disconcerting? And I was surprised when this this thought flashed across my mind. But, I mean, I haven't seen a Trump tweet for two weeks now. <laughs> do, do you find that at all worrisome that this voice has suddenly been silenced? No, because he's not silenced. I mean, that's the crazy thing. He is complaining so much about the fact that his Twitter feed is lost. But he's the former president. He could call into Fox News. He could call into CNN. He could put out press releases. There's a million other ways to get his word out that are not quite as easy as just opening up Twitter on your couch and typing it out and getting it to the world in 20 seconds. But there's no way that a man who has that much notoriety and that many allied media outlets has been silenced. He could get his word out, but for some reason he's not doing it. So he, so th- this idea that uh, he's he's been canceled, and I think Trump Nation figures that that collectively they have been canceled. That's not true as far as you're concerned. I mean, definitely not Trump Nation because they have three or four TV news networks dedicated to to, to catering to their questions and to re- regurgitating their views. The thing about Trump is think about how Trump got well, you know, well known as a political candidate in 2015 and 2016. It was partly through Twitter, but a lot of it was by calling in to shows like Morning Joe or Fox News. Yeah. And, and they would just open the line and let him say whatever he wanted. Maria Bartiromo on Fox would definitely let him do that if he wanted to. And for some reason, he's not doing it. But that line is still available to him, I think, on Fox and several other networks. OK, so it's fair to say that if he's silenced, it's because he either has nothing to say or just doesn't want to say it publicly. It's it definitely not because he has no outlets for his voice. And for people like Josh Hawley and the other Republicans who kept on voting to decertify election results, even after the attack on the Capitol, what do you think awaits them? Well, I think it's too early to say. I mean, I think some of them, you know, there's been a lot of political contributions cut off. I think there's been some, you know, some effort to investigate folks who might have like actually aided the insurrectionists in the House. You've seen people talk about expelling Hawley or Cruz from the Senate. I think it's way too early to know. A lot of these folks, you know, did the thing that Trump wanted, and Trump is still the most important figure in the Republican Party. So the consequence they care about is whether they're going to win again in two years or, you know, whenever they run again. And I think until we see Republican primaries in 2022 and we know what role Trump will play, it's really hard to say that they have been punished. They could find themselves just as powerful as they were before. David Farenthold, live from The Washington Post. David, thank you.